day. Lord, you spoke to me from your heart. And I ask you, Lord, to convey that message through my lips. Sanctify me. To be nothing that can hinder the flow of the Holy Spirit. We ask you for a demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you manifest yourself in the course of this message, I pray. Amen. Satan's final war plan exposed. The devil has a war plan, and we're going to expose it this morning. Hallelujah. Now, there, there's a final war, you know. It's called Armageddon. Millions of men are going to gather in the Mideast, and there's going to be a final war called the Battle of Armageddon. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed. But simultaneously, there's another final war. And this final war is far more important to us and to God than Armageddon. Armageddon is just a clean-up job for God. He's just going to clean up the mess. He's going to come forth with his power and his glory, and, and, and we know the outcome of that war. But there's another war going on simultaneously, and it's begun, and, and it's in effect even now. And that's the spiritual war. This, this is the war that's been declared, yes, in the Garden of Eden. You say there's always been a spiritual war, heaven against hell. Uh, but folks, the devil in these last days is changing his strategy. He's changing his plan. Because the Bible says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, the devil's come down to you having great wrath, knowing his time is short. Now, see, this is placing this battle, this last strategic battle, after the cross, because he's talking about those who've overcome by the blood and those who have the testimony of the Lamb. So this is after Calvary, it's after the cross. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Dragon was wroth with the woman. The woman is the church of Jesus Christ. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, this places the war that we're talking about after the cross, those who have been uh, covered by the blood of Christ, and this leads to the last, very last day of time, the battle that I'm speaking about. The scripture says he knows he has a short time, and, he, and the Bible says that he comes down. He's actually going to make his headquarters. He's going to be among us here on this earth. He's come down unto you. And he, he's in a rage because he knows that his time is very short. This is the last of the last days. Very clearly marked here. I don't know what others are preaching about spiritual warfare. I hear a lot of stuff that is foolishness. And even when you say spiritual warfare, a lot of people pull back. But the Bible makes it clear that there's a war going on in the heavens. There's a spiritual battle now for your mind and your soul. There's a spiritual battle in the Bible. Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Weapons of war, our war, it says. Our war. The war that you and I fight as the seed of Jesus Christ. He's going after the seed, the scripture says. And this is the battle far more important in the eyes of God and hell than Armageddon itself. The Spirit is going to expose the stratagems of the devil for this last day. I was just thinking of the strategy the devil has used ever since the Garden of Eden. Think of the strategy Satan used in the wilderness. Satan went after, the scripture says, those that were stragglers of the camp, the rear guard. He came against the weak. He came against those who were crippled and those who were diseased. He kept up with those, he, he, he came against those who were uh, not really Jews, but they, and he came out of Israel with the Jews. They wanted to be a part of what God was doing. And they were stragglers. They were really not with Israel, but he came on the rear guard, uh, almost tepid about coming into the camp itself. But when he did come to the camp, it, it, the, the, the battle then was in the natural realm. It had to do with food. It had to do with water. It, it, it had to do with just existence itself. And Satan came and tempted in, in these areas of flesh and appetite. And very little of the warfare of Satan against the church of the wilderness was aimed at the leadership. You'll find only a few occasions he came against Aaron, 
uh, for a season. He came uh, against Saul. He came against David. And, and you find individuals, but it's rare. And you find many of these men falling. But at, at that time, Satan warfare had to do with appetite. It had to do with the belly. It had to do with nature. But then comes the cross of Jesus Christ. Then comes uh, the need for a new strategy, a new plan. And folks, the devil has, the Bible says we're not ignorant of the devices or the wiles of the devil. The wiles mean plan, strategies. That very word uh, is strategy. We're, we're, we're not ignorant of his strategy. His strategy keeps changing. And now we, have, we come to the cross. We come to the strategy now of Satan coming against entire congregations. He comes against the laity. He, he comes against the church body. He comes against whole congregations. And it's amazing when you, when you follow it. He, he attacked the Corinthian church with a flood of lust and carnality. He comes to the Galatian church with a bewitching spirit. Paul said, having begun in the spirit, are you now seeking perfection through the works of the law? Who has bewitched you? Who's cast the spell on you? A new strategy from the enemy. He's going after entire congregations. He's going after the laity. You follow it through in, in Revelation, first few chapters of Revelation. <clears throat> uh, Ephesus, he attacks the church. He attacks the love and devotion to Christ. At Smyrna, Satan cast some of them in prison. He sent blasphemers into their midst. At Pergamos, false doctrine was sent to leaven the church. At Thyatira, the devil sent teachers in with the Jezebel spirit to seduce the congregations into fornication. And when you come to Sardis, you find formality and deadness cast upon them. And at Laodicea, the spirit of lukewarmness covetousness, materialism, blinded the whole congregation. You see, he's going after the laity, he's going after the congregation, he's going after the masses of believers. And you very find, very seldom do you find in the New Testament him going after, or being able to bring down spiritual leadership. Those who are spiritual men, leaders of the church of Jesus Christ. You, you find him coming again, as he did in the Old Testament, shipwrecks, beatings, jailings. He comes after Paul in the flesh. But you don't see Paul folding under it. You don't hear Peter. And you hear none of the disciples other than Judas. He's not. The battle now is for the church, the laity. He, he's going after. He's coming stages. You see, works in the natural. Then he comes against the congregation. We're going to see in just a moment where he's moving now. And I know I got this from the Holy Spirit, and God's been dealing with my heart on this issue very strongly, and it's impacted my, my, my spiritual life, and I trust it'll do the same for you this morning. You see, the buffetings were, yes, they were against the flesh, and also in the spiritual realm, but you find it against the masses. And I'm saying now that in this last day, in this short period of time, the devil with such wrath knows he has to change his strategy. And the strategy is this. I'm going after the leaders. I'm going to focus all my attention on everyone who has spiritual authority. Everyone who walks close to Christ. Every prayer warrior. I'm going after their, I'm going after their very faith. I'm going after their homes, their marriages. I'm going to try to paralyze every spiritual man and woman on the face of the earth. Now, you find a, a, a little glimpse of this strategy in the Old Testament the devil used. Ahab and, and uh, Jehoshaphat are waging war, declared war on Syria. And the devil changed his strategy. It's just a little glimpse of what was to come in the last days. I'm sure Satan remembered that strategy and how it worked. He had 32 captains, and he called them together, and he says, I've got a strategy, I've got a plan. 
I want 32 captains, the charioteers, the captains of the chariots. And we have one mission. I don't want you to fight with any soldiers. I want you to go right through the camps of the enemy, and I want you to get Saul. Let me read it to you. The king of Syria commanded his 30 and 2 captains that had ruled over the chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. He said, We get him, they're all going to flee. They have no leadership. They have no one with authority. They'll run to their homes and they'll run to the caves. And that's exactly what happened when an arrow by chance, it wasn't by chance, you and I know that, but an arrow hits Saul, he dies in his chariot, and the scripture says there was a proclamation made throughout the host, every man now to his city, every man to his own country. In other words, we have no leadership. Every man for himself, run. And all that's happening to the church of Jesus Christ today is we see this strategy unfolding everywhere we look. Pastors, missionaries, Christian leaders, deacons, elders falling left and right. Spiritual authority being robbed. We see this strategy unfolding before our very eyes. This was the strategy used in Iraq. They were called special forces and they were sent six months before the war into Baghdad. And their whole job, they were dressed as Arabs. And they had a bankroll. And they were to trail Saddam, Saddam Hussein everywhere he went. And you remember the night of the first bombing. The first attack came because there was an intelligence report. And they called it strategic planning. And that... First huge bombing effort came on a palace where intelligence said Saddam and his staff were having a meeting. And many still believe he was killed in that first attack. But if you remember the war, the British were given the city to the, the, that was blocking to the right and a highway all the way to Baghdad, 150 miles of troops and tanks. One purpose, one purpose, surround Baghdad, get Saddam, get the leadership. Don't fight with the Iraqi army, go to the elite corps, the Republican Guard, and when we get that Republican Guard and those 50 leaders, they'll fall and they'll collapse. And within two weeks of the war, remember, there was confusion in the Iraqi army because they said, there's no leadership, there's no one there, it's inoperative, the authority's gone. Satan's final war against the church of Christ is targeted at the elect. Paralyze every spiritual leader. Destroy, seduce, bewitch all spiritual authority. And now you see the devil's laid his hands on every invention of man to use in this battle. The devil owns the internet. He owns it. 300,000 porno sites. He owns it. He owns the film industry. HBO, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> but I read that that's some of the worst filth coming out of hell. I don't even know what the music channel is. I don't have television. But he owns television now. He owns commercial television. He owns network television. Because you see... Up to this time, they said, we, we're going to stretch the envelope. That means, see how far we can go without the people rising up, without a moral outcry. Outcry against this filth and smut, and there's no outcry anymore. And now, I read in the New York Times, these were from film directors in the Cannes Festival in France, and they were boasting publicly, we're no longer stretching the envelope, we've torn it up, we're going over the ledge. That means anything goes. And folks, who is all of this? Where, who, who's the devil aiming at? Now, do you think he's aiming at all the people who are hooked on pornography now? All of the wicked masses who are hooked on the lust of the flesh? He already owns them. The king of Syria said, I'm not wasting any ammunition, no chariots, no manpower on these masses. All my power, everything is aimed at the leadership. 
These things are aimed now. Everything out of hell is aimed. You say, are you talking only about pastors? It advances. No, I'm, 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 let me tell you what gives you spiritual authority. Let me tell you what in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the devil, make you marked. In the eyes of God, marked for righteousness and marked for usefulness. In the devil's eye, marked for this final attack. Is that you have set your heart on Christ. You seek him with all your heart and mind and soul and spirit. You've turned from the things of this world. And, and you have laid a hold of something that you won't let go and the devil knows it. And you're a testimony of the righteousness of Christ in this dark, wicked age. If you're a praying man or woman, believing, trusting God, living in his righteousness by faith, you are marked. You're in that leadership. You are in that elite guard. Not, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. He's not going after the children of death. He's not going after his own children. He's got them. Why would he waste any? He'd be a stupid devil to waste his ammunition on those he's already killed. S Satan understands that secret sin in a spiritual man will paralyze him. All his power and authority will be gone. And if sin is persisted on and becomes habitual, he knows the man can no longer speak for God, can no longer have any impact on anyone living in sin. The Bible says, on the King James, it said, dead flies in the ointment. But in the original Hebrew, it says, flies of death cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, smell. So that the little folly, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. He said, God says, I want to, I want to show you. He's speaking from his word. I want to show you. It's, the, it's that dead fly. It's what you think insignificant has not been judged. And you, that the enemy comes and just throws in that sweet smelling savor, that prayer life. There's a dead fly. See, there's a compromise. There's something of the world. There's something out of sin. There's something of flesh. And, and he, the Bible says, the dead fly in your oil of anointment, your oil of unction, your oil of anointing, a dead fly, that one thing that God's been dealing with, that one thing. He said, that, that beautiful aroma has been coming up again to send forth a stench. To stink up the place. And anyone who's been touched with the favor of God and held in honor. You see, the Lord says, no dark place in our hearts. Nothing that the enemy can touch. Satan come with has nothing in me. And there's a reason for that. And that'll unfold here as you see it in just a moment. You see, the devil's plan is to put this fly of death. Just a touch of flesh, a touch of the world. Let me tell you what's at stake. And the reason Satan's now focusing all his power on the spiritual man. Paul sets forth the issue, and here it is. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Paul said, now there's a spiritual man and there's a natural man. The spiritual man knows the mind of Christ. He's full of the Holy Ghost. No part dark, no flies of death in him. He's got spiritual wisdom. He has revelation from God. He has an open heaven. And God reveals his mind to the spiritual man. The scripture says, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Things that no man can know. And God gives it. And speaks it through those who are spiritual. Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He said, When you came to hear me preach, and when I came to Corinth, he was speaking about his visit to Corinth, and he said, When I came to you, he said, I determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Because Paul knew that congregation. They were living in fornication, incest. They, they were living in covetousness. They, they were coming and drinking unworthily at the, the Lord's table. And he said, 
He, 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 he said, I had to make a determination how I was going to come to you. I can't come with wisdom. He said, I learned it at Athens. That I can't match my wits with the world. He said, I determined when I come to you, I'll know nobody. I'll preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. But he said, when I came to you, and this is in retrospect, he's looking back and in a letter, he said, when I came to you, you know how I came. Some of you said my, my speech was contemptible. You could hardly stand my, my delivery. But he said it wasn't in my preaching. It wasn't in man's wisdom. But I had an anointing on me. I had heard from heaven. And I came in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. Now what is that? Demonstration of the Holy Ghost. We have a lot of people who think the demonstration of the Holy Ghost people falling on the floor. Wiggling. Shaking. Now God can shake you and wiggle you. I, I, I believe God can take people and just prostrate them. I'm not mocking that. But that's not what Paul's talking about. The demonstration of the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with Paul's body. It was not raising his voice like I'm raising mine right now because a loud voice doesn't, it doesn't imply anointing. Sometimes when you get anointed, you can't help it. You just explode. But that does not designate the anointing. See, the demonstration of the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit was not some our, our countenance that changed in Paul. He was not doing anything but quietly delivering the word of God. And there was suddenly a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. It was the word of God delivered through a spiritual man. You see, the Corinthians had moved out of the spiritual realm into the natural realm. And that's what's happening to the church of Jesus Christ today. You sit in front of a television and you drink and drink and drink and I'm telling you, slipping hour by hour into the natural man that can no longer comprehend the things of God because you lose your discernment. And now, Paul said, I'm coming to Corinth to a natural people. Living in the flesh, they're natural again. They're not spiritual men and women. They're carnal. The carnal man is the natural man. He said, I couldn't even speak to you as spiritual people anymore. Demonstration of the Holy Ghost with power was the effect his preaching had on the hearers, on the people, on the Corinthians. And let me give you an explanation of the demonstration, and here it is. You see, Paul had preached about separation and holiness. But be not, unequal, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Come out from among them. Be separate and clean. Touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. And that word of Paul was so anointed of the Holy Spirit. There was a demonstration. Life change is the demonstration. People walking out of the house of God with a message they can't shake out of their head. Or out of their heart. And they have to act on it. Because the Holy Spirit keeps moving them in the direction of the word they've received. And here it is. You sorrowed to repentance. You were made sorry after a godly manner. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what cleansing, what carefulness, what clearing of yourself. Indignation, what zeal, what fear. <sighs> What vehement desire, what revenge, in all things you've reproved yourselves clear in this matter. He said you wouldn't eat, sleep, you wouldn't do anything until you made sure you lined up to the word that I preached. They had drifted from Christ and were compromising. You see, folks, here's the dilemma. We go out now... Let me put it as simply as I can. You show me a church of 10,000, 25,000 people, masses coming. And those that come to church, if, if they're not a preaching of repentance, if they're not changing, they're, they're all natural people. They're carnal. They're still living in sin. Because there's no message and there's no conviction and no Holy Ghost moving in the church. 
And if the man in the pulpit is just a man of ambition, if he too is in the natural and he is in the flesh, then I'm going to tell you that a whole congregation could go to hell because they've never had a mess. They don't understand. There's nobody there to open their eyes. There's no message from heaven that pierces the wall. There's nothing that gets through to the heart. And I'm convinced there's many people are going to hell in the church than anywhere else in society. Going to hell right in church. Because natural men are speaking to natural men and they don't understand. The divorce rate in the church equals the divorce rate in the world now. The divorce rate in the ministry equals the divorce rate in secular society. What a sad comment. Now what's my point? Satan knows that men seduced back into the realm of the natural can no longer hear or receive a word that can change a life. Comes blinded. There's no message, no anointing, nothing that pierces the heart. And that's why Satan's going after every spiritual elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher, anyone in any kind of ministry, choir, going after with everything out of hell. And I'm telling you, folks, there's never been a time when you have been more tested than you are now. Come on now. You have never been more tested. Your faith has never been more tried than it is now. I was talking to a neighbor recently. I just walked over, talked to him. He was drinking. He said, are you the reverend? I said, yeah. He said, I, I thought some old foggy preacher was going to move next to me when you moved here. He said, but I checked you on the Internet. He said, I think you're okay. <laughs> he, he said, I got to talk to you, sir. He said, I, my wife left me two years ago. I had a... I was a high up executive in a company and he named the company. He said two years ago they just fired me. No explanation, just cut me off after almost 20 years of service. And he said to top it off, the only thing I'd left was my dog and I loved that dog and it was killed. Car accident. Car ran over, a police officer ran over. And he said, I've been here two years just drinking. Here's a natural man. And I just stood listening to this man. I said, oh, God, the only way I can get one word to that man gets to his heart is there better be nothing in my life that hinders the voice of God. I had better hear from heaven. I don't want any dead fly in me, and I'm thinking, God, no dead flies. And I thank God I could stand there, and the Lord says, you have the word. And I gave him just two or three paragraphs, two or three cutting sentences I know went right to his heart. And I, I look out of my room where I pray, and I look right over to his house, and I know the Holy Ghost is there moving. He's still quoting those words over and over again. And they were just probably two paragraphs, but it got right to, to the heart. Folks, never in history have we, needed, have we needed spiritual people who know the mind of Christ and they can stand against the world and all of the natural thing that, that's just destroying mankind and have that word that penetrates and changes where there's a demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Folks, t tonight, t this, after, this morning and all day, you may sit quiet. You may not even respond emotionally to what I'm saying. But I hope and pray when you walk out the door, God will have said something to you that will change your life. Make some changes. Your life has already been changed, but make those changes that are necessary to come into the fullness that the Lord has prepared for you. He said, well, Brother Wilson, Brother Dave, uh, what's God going to do about all this? 
If the devil has a plan, what does, does God have a plan? Well, I want to tell you something. The, de- the, the Lord is not going to come down and fight your battle with the devil. He's already done that. He's already conquered the devil. He, he's, made, he, he's been victor. He's beyond the reach of Satan. The devil can't tempt him anymore. But he says, now, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, God doesn't have to change his plan. He's had one eternal purpose from the beginning, and that, that's focus on Jesus Christ, and we know that. But let me show you, and, and I've read this over and over again, but the Holy Spirit pointed this out to me. What I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to achieve and is achieving now in this last hour. And this amazing verse in Isaiah 9, 7, don't turn there, but... Because of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The government shall be upon his shoulders and of the increase of that government, there shall be no end. In other words, there from the very time that the government of God was established, those... Through the testimony of Jesus Christ, he is Lord. The Holy Spirit says, I'll come and inhabit you, but I come to govern your life. And it implies that once you come under the government of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of Christ, when you come under that government, there is to be a continual increase. There has to be an increase. We increase in obedience and submission, subjection. To all that the word of God speaks to us until this nothing, nothing is believed, nothing is done. Everything is judged by the word of the Lord, by the voice of the Holy Spirit, of the increase of his government. Are you under the government of the Holy Spirit? This is how I believe God is going to protect his leadership. He's going to protect all of those who are in the spiritual man. He's going to protect you, not by, he's not going to end pornography. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, the Bible said. Things are going to get so bad that sexual content will be bestial. It'll be incestuous. It'll be with children. It's going to be with animals. It's going to be the most incredible filth and smut the world's ever known. And, And God's not going to stop that right now until the end. The devil is going to come with his flood. The flood is going to increase. The flood tides are going to get higher. But he's going to build up a spiritual immunity. He's going to do something in the hearts of his people. Because the government of Jesus Christ is going to increase more and more. He's going to have a body who are more and more subjected to the Holy Ghost. Who cry out for that direction. Who submit themselves in prayer and to the word of God. And they begin to judge their sins righteously. We're to judge righteous judgment. Now, I want you to follow me before I close. I'm going to wrap this up in just a moment. Verse 7 again. He will establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for more. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform it. God says that zeal means jealousy. He said, I, in the last days, when he sees this attack of the enemy... God says, I'm going to rise with a jealousy, and I'm going to accomplish my purpose. And my purpose, as he describes here, I'm going to bring divine order, and I'm going to bring forth a spirit of judgment. Now, that's not, that that is not judgment against us. This has to do with something far different. It's something he's going to do in our hearts, a spirit of judgment against anything that Satan throws against us. In other words, the Holy Ghost is going to make you a magistrate of your own heart. And the word there is litigate. It means everything that comes. And here's what Paul the Apostle said in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 5. He that is spiritual, listen, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. He judges all things. It means that everything that the enemy throws into his life, every temptation, everything he's involved in, every waking hour, he's judging everything that influences or affects his life. He's judging it. He's a magistrate. And the Lord has empowered him by his spirit to sit as a judge over his own life. 
He said, if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. You know that scripture. Let me put it plainly. If you're flirting, you're flirting with a married person, or another man's wife, or another one's husband, that's adultery. Judge it. Call it what it is. It's sin. Call it. The Bible says, set no wicked thing before your eyes. You just brought in a video. And you said, oh, it's just PG or PG-13. It, it's just Walt Disney. And suddenly, here's God's name being cursed. What are you going to do? You just going to justify it? Are you going to judge it? Will you sit there and allow the Holy Ghost just to stir your heart? He will do it. He will stir your heart. And he'll do it out of love because he says, I need your anointing. I need a voice. I need to penetrate this wicked world. I need you. I'm not mad at you, but I need your voice. And he's going to convict you. You either justify it or you'll judge it and say, this could cost my anointing. That's enough. <laughs> judge it. You find yourself slipping into a little bit of gossip. And the Holy Ghost suddenly says, hey, this is wrong. This is wrong. And you agree with the Holy Ghost. Yes, it's wrong. And you stop and shut your mouth and walk away. Judge it. You see, David sinned. And he wouldn't judge his sin for a whole year. God didn't break his covenant with David. He didn't break the covenant. He's not going to break his covenant with you. But he said, a prophet. And what the issue was, David, until you agree with the Holy Ghost, until you judge your sin and call it what it is, and not justify. David had been justified, and as soon as David stopped justifying his sin, then the promises of the covenant were renewed in his life. And every covenant promise of God awaits the moment that you and I agree with the Holy Ghost and say, this is sin. I'm not going to call it by another name. I'm going to judge it. I can't, I can't live in unbelief. Unbelief is the mother of all sins. And you find yourself doubting God and questioning God. Oh, come on, folks. Judge it for what it is. It's sin. And if we don't judge it, all we're doing is preaching eternal security. We have to judge our sins because he has given us the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ in us. We have the Holy Ghost. Now I'll tell you, the moment you agree with the Holy Ghost, he comes with every covenant promise, and the Bible makes it clear. This scripture, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against. And I looked up that word standard, and you know what it really means? A flip of the finger. And the moment you agree with the Holy Spirit, the moment you judge your sin and say, I'm not going to lose my anointing. I'm not going to have a fly in my ointment. I'm not going to let the devil rob me of my effectiveness. And I judge my sin. When that happens, the Holy Ghost comes and flits away the power of hell in your life. Just the flick of his finger. It's done. It's finished. He empowers you with his glorious power. That's the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. The demonstration is judging your sin. The power comes flowing in. Glory be to God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Will you stand? Hallelujah. 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 My God, my God. Oh, Jesus. Would you just raise your hands and tell them how much you love him? In the annex, wherever you're at, raise your hands. Tell them how much. Come on, just tell them from your heart, Lord, I love you and I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, we need you in this day. Oh, bless your name. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Lord, you so love your people. You so love your pastors and shepherds and all those in leadership. They're your family. They're, they're bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And you will not allow the enemy to destroy. You're going to come forth, Lord, with great governing power. You're going to manifest by your spirit the law of God written in the heart. Bringing us under subjection to your word and your spirit. And Lord, we're going to be more than overcomers. Not just overcomers, but more than overcomers. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, I'm asking for a demonstration of power. Demonstration of your spirit with power to change us. For those that are here now, and while we're speaking, Holy Ghost, you were just pointing out something. Perhaps a dead fly, a fly of death. Something that the Holy Ghost has been just peacefully, wonderfully, lovingly nagging us about. Saying, change it. Make a change before it becomes a habit. And you no longer see it as sin. You justify it. Oh, Lord, we want to agree with the Holy Ghost. We call it what it is. If you're here this afternoon or this morning... And something in the message this morning, is something grabbed your heart. I don't know how to put this other than as I feel like the Holy Spirit that you know that you are not where you ought to be in Christ. Especially if you've, you've been walking with God for a long time. If you've been hearing a lot of messages, you've been hearing the Holy Ghost speak and cry and woo and whisper to your heart. And you keep putting it off and putting it off. It's time. It's time this morning to say yes, the Holy Spirit. If there is sin, he's not here to condemn you. He's here to say, I will not lose you. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to make a little bit of misery in your heart. I'm going to convict you, but I do it because I need you. If you're a husband, I, I, you need that spiritual authority and you need his guidance. If you're a wife or if you're a mother and you have children, you need spiritual authority. You're not going to get through your kids without spiritual authority. If there's anything that you know in your life, in all honesty, that can rob you of that spiritual authority, I want you to get down to this front and just stand here with me and we're going to pray and ask God to have you call it what it is and believe God to come with his spirit and give you a freedom this morning and you walk out of here the power of Christ what I believe the Holy Spirit is leading me to say you know, I always say it lovingly this congregation I say to as a father hundreds of you on Go to work, you're on the job, you work in offices, you work with other people of other sex. You women work with men and some of you men work with women. And I'm telling you now, the Lord made it clear to me that I have to say this. Many of you now, right now, have to ask God to help you stop your flirtation. It's not become, a, not become an act yet, but the seed is there. You come with anticipation and every time that man or that woman passes, you... There's something going on in your heart. And the Lord says, call it what it is. It's adultery. It's adultery. If you look upon another woman or another man with lust, Jesus said, that's adultery. Call it what it is. And say, Lord, I want that change now. That's the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And God, when you say that, God will come with the power of your spirit. there will be a demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. So right now, deal with that. If, if you, Pastor, all the pastors... Including myself, we have, we have warned you about your viewing television and, and the filth and the films that you bring into your home and everything else. In these areas, if that has to be dealt with, agree with it right now. Agree with it. If you don't have the zeal or you live in a situation where you can't remove a television from your home, 
and your husband or your wife disagree with you, all right, fine. But I'm going to tell you something. Ask the Lord. When you sit there, say, Lord, the moment you see it or hear it, or God's name, curse, you get out of the room. You go somewhere else. If you out, go shop and do whatever you have to do. Take an act. An act. It says, Lord, I, I will not cast my eyes upon that which is evil. And when you walk the streets, ask God to give you clean eyes. Ask God to help you because the seductions are so overwhelming. And ask God to put you in the habit of listening to the Holy Spirit. It becomes a wonderful habit. The Holy Spirit is so quick, so quick. It's a loving judgment. It's something the Lord says, I do this for you because I so love you. I do this for you because... I've done such a miracle in your life, and I want to use you with your neighbors. I want you to be the testimony, because I want everything that you say to have an impact on those around you. When your neighbors are sick and afflicted, when somebody around you has a problem, they bring it to you. So you're not just mouthing words that fall to the ground, but you're saying things that penetrate the heart. Do you understand that? I said, do you understand that? Even in the annex right now, others in the congregation didn't come forward. God's dealing He's dealing lovingly with these things that hinder us. They hinder you from the fullness and from the anointing and the blessing and render you paralyzed, inoperative. So I ask God to do something of, of great uh, conviction, a, f a loving conviction, so that we determine we're going to walk in the spiritual man. Father, I come now asking you, Holy Spirit, to demonstrate what we're talking about. Holy Spirit, I want to see and I, I don't want to see it, but I want you to demonstrate in the hearts of these that there be a manifestation of your Holy Spirit that comes right now and, and just comes and shines the light in and says, yes, I know, Lord, that what I have allowed is sin. And I agree with you, Holy Spirit, that can't go on. It has to stop. And I know, Lord, as I agree with you, you're going to come now with every precious covenant promise you're going to put a new heart in me on this. You're going, to, you're going to keep me now from falling. You're going to give me a heart after you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this. Would you say this right now? Lord Jesus, I come humbly to you. And I come, Lord Jesus, to submit to your government. I want you to rule my life by the word and the still small voice of the Spirit. I want to obey you, Lord. Help me. I can't do it in my strength. But I believe that the Holy Ghost saved, came and saved me by opening my heart. And I've repented. So the Spirit of God is in me. Thank you that you'll guide me. You will keep me. We give you thanks. Now, will you raise your hands and just thank Jesus for his faithfulness to you, Lord? I thank you for your faithfulness, for your great love. What a wonderful Savior.